please open in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. Sorry. Excellent. Mark chapter 7. So for any of guests that might be joining us on the stream, good morning, happy Thanksgiving. I hope you and your family or extended family have a delightful holiday celebration together and that you, like me, are nowhere near uh, the malls or shopping uh, centers uh, this Friday. Today uh, marks a day that uh, is remembered and um, a great day to be remembered, as one commentator uh, suggested, Um, and that is today marks the 159th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address, when the cemetery for those soldiers who had fallen during the battle of Gettysburg that cemetery, that national cemetery, was commemorated by our 16th president, President Lincoln, uh, and, um, and done so with a remarkable uh, speech that is arguably, if not the greatest speech given by an American uh, president, one of the greatest, But it's only 272 words long, meaning it can be recited in less than two minutes. In fact, because I am a history teacher, for extra credit, as we head into tests for my U.S. history students, I have them memorize portions of speeches, and they have a major test this Tuesday. Someone might be watching, as they are apt to do. And... um, Yes, you must have the whole speech memorized for extra credit, uh, but it's worth 10 bonus points. And you know this about teenagers. They can be more anxious and concerned about bonus points on the test than what's on the actual test. And as long as they get the bonus points, they feel like it is a... Anyway, this was a day to be remembered, as the president suggested. And in the speech, you know some of the words. I'm not going to recite it. Uh, he said in those words that he wrote himself. He did not have a speechwriter. He did have a personal secretary with him. Contrary to popular myth, he spent five months writing this speech. He didn't wing it and write it on a napkin, you know, over coffee earlier that morning. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men Presumably, all women are created equal. And then, as the speech concluded, in that it was dedicating a national cemetery of soldiers who had died in battle, and there were no rooms in Gettysburg. It's a small enough town, but there were so many families there of soldiers who had fallen and so many others there that Lincoln had to stay with a friend overnight He said this, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. One aside. Uh, I don't use a textbook to teach history. I use documents. And when students read documents and not textbooks, they have to then engage with what historians engage in, and that is, what did the text say? And what was the point of view of the, the speech or the writer? And, and they like this one. 
there's no argument over this one. Some of the other documents I give them, they're not quite as fond of. But they like this one, and, and I know you do too. So happy Thanksgiving. That day, 159 years ago, was preceded by another executive decision, and that's the a Thanksgiving holiday. That's why we celebrate it in October. He made a proclamation, set aside the day of Thanksgiving to thank God for his providential care of this nation and to pray in that we are engulfed in a great civil war. I want to suggest to you that this passage in Mark is another great day to be remembered by us. And although no speech is made, there, Jesus does do what he does in a remarkable shortness of words, he does do something in this passage which he hasn't done before in Mark. He shows you what he's feeling. He shows you what he's feeling. We get a window into the Savior's emotions. And yet, the people who get to see that side of him, it's completely unexpected. And the words that they respond to not only his emotions, but his actions, come right out of Scripture. But they haven't been taught the Bible. They're Gentiles. Yet God seemingly put into their mouths in response to what Jesus did. Words that I, I'm afraid many Christians don't realize describe Jesus today. So good news. This is a day to be remembered in a small passage that I think will have application not only to our study of Mark, but as we go into the Thanksgiving holiday, as we consider who Jesus is, what he came to do, and how he is still at work today in our lives. So let's look at Mark 7, the last section of the gospel, or the chapter, beginning in verse 31. This is God's word. And if you're streaming with us and you don't have a copy of the scriptures, it's projected behind me. There's also a link on your screen that you can click Bible Gateway can use the search engine to find Mark 7, beginning in verse 31. Then Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. Note this. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, Jesus put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Afada, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, quote, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak, unquote. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this episode in Mark's gospel and in the few moments that remain. We pray now, gather, gather our thoughts before this text. Show us Jesus. If he is familiar, deepen our perception of him. And if this is an unfamiliar passage, open our eyes and open our ears. Open our hearts to hear and receive and listen to him, respond to him. 
and make this. Make this passage. Make this day, this Sunday in November, a great day to be remembered. Because, Father, you glorified your Son. Spirit, you, 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 you brought attention of the Son's actions and activities, not only in Scripture, but in our lives. That we might, that we might not only believe in him, but we would follow him and do the things he has called and commanded us to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just can't leave the Lincoln gay bird's dress for one more comment. It has nothing to do with the message. I didn't realize that Lincoln spoke following a two-hour speech by a man from Massachusetts, Edward Everett. Governor Edward Everett of Massachusetts, president of Harvard, pastor of a Unitarian church, pastor of a Unitarian church, not quite so excited about that. Edward Everett, he was the most sought-after speaker of his day. He was retired and doing speaking tours. But he said to Lincoln at the end of the speech, after having opined for two hours, Everett said to Lincoln, I should be glad if I could flatter myself that I came as near to the central idea of this occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes. May God grant me grace to say in a few minutes what Jesus says so plainly here about himself. Seven brief verses. Mark presents another episode in the life and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth that captures his humanity, his sensitivity, his compassion, and his gentleness for an individual. He really does come across in this brief episode as a gentle, sensitive savior who is moved with compassion towards us. So here's my main point, though. It's not as effective and potent as what we're about to read and consider again. True faith, true faith comes by listening to what Jesus says and confessing with your heart what Jesus reveals about himself to be true. Jesus grants this individual the ability to hear, physically hear him speak to him. And so there's where I get my hearing from. And those who witness it, verse 37 are literally proclaiming, confessing all things that he does. He does well. Verse 37. So that's the basis of my main point. The message will fall out into five, if you will, segments. These aren't so much points. They just follow the story that Mark has recorded for us. The place and the need, the manner of ministry and the miracle itself, the command, and then the confession, verse 37. So let's start with the place, the place, verse 31. It says Jesus returned. Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. Mark story begins by telling us in verse 31 that Jesus is continuing his journey into non-Jewish territory. He was there last week in that dramatic episode with the Syrophoenician woman and her, her daughter who was manifesting the, the presence of evil spirits. And the journey continues this week into Gentile territory. He's deep in Gentile 
territory. In fact, I think in, in this gospel and maybe in the gospels, it's the only time Jesus leaves, leaves, if you will, the borders and boundaries of the Jewish nation and, and is in non-Jewish territory. So it is a surprising statement to Mark's readers, I'm sure, as they read this, that Jesus is journeying as he is. So it's a journey filled with significance for us. But perhaps more significant than the place is the need. Because the need that we are focused on in verse 32 is the need of an individual. A man who is deaf and has a speech impediment. Literally, he's mute. You see that projected, verse 32, above me. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impairment. And they, his friends, who brought him to Jesus, begged him to lay his hands on him, presumably to pray for him, to minister to him. One of the scholars that Dave, Dan, and I have consulted in this study is a gentleman named Peter Bolt, and he wrote a, a work in called The Cross at a Distance, Atonement in Mark's Gospel, and he made the following observation about this story in light of how Mark presents the life and ministry of Jesus. And Jim, this is quote number one. I'm going to read the whole quote because he, he highlighted something that no one to my knowledge drew, drew my attention to, and I think it's, I think it's significant. Throughout Mark's story, if you'll read along with me, a range of characters appear in the story encounter Jesus, and then disappear again. From among these minor characters, a group of 13 can be separated out and be labeled the suppliants, meaning those who come to Jesus and they have a great need. Mark pays greater attention to these suppliants, giving each of them a whole scene where their story is told. These are the ones who come to Jesus with a need, a need for healing or deliverance, which Jesus meets. And this group of 13 shows us a slice of life in the first century world. Despite their variety, together they illustrate a world in great need, a world under the shadow of death. They also show that the Jewish religion was completely unable to help them in their need. In fact, it probably even made their situation worse by excluding them as unclean and so making God seem even further away. Dr. Bolt, a Markan scholar, is telling us that in Mark's gospel there are no less than 13 of these episodes that focus on individuals. I'm all about Jesus making his identity known to the crowd, like when he feeds the 4,000 or feeds the 5,000. I, I love those scenes. But Mark's gospel as an emphasis seems to draw more attention to Jesus' interaction with an individual. And why am I telling you that? That, that's good news to me. Thank you. And that's good news to you. Because that means this Thanksgiving, this Thanksgiving, your Thanksgiving, my Thanksgiving table, or if someone's not there at the table, Jesus, Jesus is pursuing an individual. Are you aware of that? He's in Decapolis. <laughs> He's not in the temple. He's in the region of the unclean, according to the religious authorities. He's not in church. He's with people who are alienated from God and the people of God and the church. And Jesus is ministering to the individual. That, gives me, that brings me to tears. From Scripture, third. 15 times, Jesus, in a sense, leaves the 99 and pursues the one 
because he is a gentle, compassionate, sympathetic savior. So if you feel like your affections for God are cold. And you may even say you're a Christian, or maybe you're not. You come to God cold. We're all cold these days, well, at least I am. I've got more layers on than my vacuum cleaner has attachments. Um, the good news, Jesus doesn't need you to be warm to come to him. He comes to you. If you feel unclean, there's shame in your background for something you've done or left undone. We all have, right? We all have skeletons. And we all deal with them differently. Good news. Jesus comes to you. And according to scripture here, he knows all my skeletons. He comes to me. Not to scold me, but to love me. To reveal himself to me. To offer me a way of escape from those skeletons, if you will. But nonetheless, He's taking the initiative, amen? Amen. If you're a Christian and you are overwhelmed with grief today, overwhelmed, either with your grief or the grief of someone you're caring for, the good news is Jesus is with you and with them too. We can pray that God would open their eyes to see that because the gospel of Mark heralds a savior who not only cares for individuals, but, but goes and finds them where they are. That's the need. By the way, you know I have hearing loss, but someone who is deaf, like, say, Helen Keller, has said that when you can't see something, you lose connection with objects, like a car or your dog or your play. When you can't see something, you, you lose. But when you can't hear something, this is Helen Keller. You can argue with her if you disagree with this. <laughs> you lose connection with people. And so this deaf individual has lost connection with people. He's isolated. He's lonely. I'm projecting that. He has friends that brought him to Jesus. But hey, lest you can't relate to that, can you imagine, musicians, if today you lost your ability to hear your music? Not just because you're a gifted musician. Can you imagine? Forget, for, that would stink. That's right, Mike McLaren. I'm not sure what you said, but that would stink. That would be horrible, right? All the, all the things that we draw from music not only during Advent season, but every day, right? It brings, it brings, we've been gifted to enjoy melody. And it speaks, I mean, that psychology is clear. Music speaks that part of our brain where emotion is located. So there's emotion involved with music. I mean, come on. When the Patriots, I know they're not playing well, but still, when they come running out of the tunnel and they play that song, I'm not even a true Patriot fan, I get excited, even though I know what may happen in the next 30 minutes. <laughs> when, when a song comes on the radio that is associated with a good memory, and I'm driving down the road, of course, I'm a safe driver, so I'm driving between the lines, and I'm not driving fast as I'm listening to my favorite song, all of a sudden, this memory comes into of, of where I was when I heard that song or sang that song or had that song perform, and so it also... Can you imagine if all that were taken away from you? Which makes then what Jesus does for this man new creation. New creation. He's starting something new. The ability to hear and the ability to express himself and what he hears. New creation. We talk a lot about that during Easter. It's called Resurrection Sunday. But Mark is suggesting we need to bring new creation forward and talk about it every Sunday. Life-giving abilities 
and desires and experiences from God himself through the Son, by the Spirit that enable us to bring glory to him, to do and obey what he has taught us to do, and to worship him. As we've pointed out before, not only is the need there, but the manner and ministry of Jesus is important because Mark slows down. Even for Mark, this is slow. He slows down and starts piling on the details. And you noticed that when you read it. I did too. And all of a sudden, we're reading now and beginning in verses 33 and 35, how Jesus ministers to this man. And anytime Mark slows down and starts giving details, that signals slow down, this is important. Six details he gives, six. I counted them, my math's terrible, you check my math. Verse 33, he takes the deaf man aside from the crowd, first detail, so he can minister to him privately. He puts his fingers in his ears, second detail. And after sitting on his hands, what am I about to read here? He spits, right, upon his hands, third detail. Sorry, I can't read my notes. Then he looks up to heaven. That's not a throwaway line. You're reading this carefully, right? This is God's inspired detail. Jesus looks up to heaven. Then he sighs, and finally Jesus says, be opened. I would want you to be frustrated with me as an expositor of God's word. If I rushed through those details and we didn't say, what's up with this? I don't care what I think it means. Why is Mark inspired through Peter's remembrance of this to slow down and give us six details? A deaf man who can see but that can't hear and can't speak, and Jesus privately ministers to him. In that culture, perhaps, deafness was a stigma, or at least the crowd was a distraction. But so that he has, you know my phrase with the kids, do I have your eyes, do I have your eyes? So he has the man's eyes, he begins to engage him in a number of physical gestures. He can't hear, but he can see. And so if I suddenly lost my hearing, and Linda, my beloved bride, were engaging in a number of hand gestures towards me, Paul would conclude either Bauer's in trouble, they're having a conflict, and Linda's giving him the business, or she's using sign language. Jesus is using nonverbal language to communicate with this man because he is a sensitive, gentle, sympathetic Savior that cares for the individual. And yeah, I get it. If I ask to pray for you and I spit on my hands first and start swabbing you with that, you should physically push me away. But back then, that was common practice. It wasn't violating any type of personal privacy, hygiene thing going on, you know. So spitting would have signaled to this guy, growing up in that culture, "You're you're gonna minister to me. And putting his hands in his ears right? It's just signaling, prepare yourself for this miracle. I don't think Jesus had to do any of this for the miracle to occur. He hasn't, up to this point, done any of these things for miracles to occur. For the, for the, for the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman, she's arguing with him about, you know, those things, and he says some things that we worked through last week, and he just says, go your way. Your daughter has been delivered. 
because we've said throughout this gospel, Jesus is presented as one with unmatched authority. Unmatched authority, unmatched authority. But here we have, we have six different actions that the deaf and mute man can see. And so we, we, we have to conclude that the, although he has authority and power, and he could have just in a word said, here, listen, be restored. He goes through all of this to communicate to the man who was deaf in a language he could understand. I care about you. I care about you. I'm meeting you where you are at. He doesn't need to do this. I care about you. The disciples are observing on this, and they're, they're observing his model of ministry. They're saying, look, look at what he's doing. He hasn't done this before. What? Why? And with an unclean, unrepentant enemy of our people, I care about you. He acts out for the man what he intends to do. In other words, this man is not simply a problem that Jesus has been sent to fix. He's an individual that God's promised King, the Messiah, our Savior, has come to love. And while he's caring for him, he looks up to heaven, lest the deaf man not realize that what is about to occur is an act of heaven through the Messiah. He looks up to heaven. And then he sighs. Oh. Some translation, right, he moans. Must have been loud enough for Peter to hear it, who was there, or the other disciples. Mark's so sparing in describing Jesus' emotions. Pastors past have seized upon this, like Octavius Winslow in his great sermon. He was a He preached at Metropolitan Tabernacle in Charles Spurgeon's day, great Baptist preacher and church leader. Winslow wrote a sermon called The Sigh of Jesus, and just on this one verse, as he can do, you wouldn't want me to just preach on one verse. But I know you're asking the question I ask, Jesus knows he's going to heal him. Why the sigh? Details matter. Why the sigh bower? Why is Jesus sighing? Why would he sigh? Shouldn't he be joyful? Peter, John, James, you're go- get ready. We are about to sing the house of the Lord. He sighs. He sighs because, as all seem to be agreed, this man's deafness and his speech impediment are a reason why he came. Stay with me. And what he came to do in giving his life, as Mark will unfold this more in chapter 8, as a ransom for many. This man's deafness and his speech impediment is a casualty of the fall. And Jesus has come as the promised king, yes, to offer his life as a ransom for our sin in order to take upon the cross its punishment so that through his death in our place, God's judgment against our sin would be finished. Amen? And through his triumphant resurrection, as Paul describes it, new creation begins. Through not only the conversion of our hearts, where we are indwelt by the Spirit, and we taste and see a foretaste of the resurrection life that not only enables us to to believe in Jesus and repent of our sin and 
confess his name and grow more and repent of our sins, but it's a first installment. It's a deposit of a day coming when we will experience the consummation of the new creation, not just in new bodies, but a new heaven and a new earth. Not a replacement, I don't believe, but a redeemed new heaven, new earth. So his healing prior to his conversion and this sigh is full of theological significance and personal compassion. I think why that's good news, because the miracle does occur, is that if you are a Christian this morning, he, spiritually speaking, has opened your ears. You may have, for many years prior to that moment, that decision where you confessed Jesus and you brought your sin to the Lord and you, you repented and you said, I trust you, forgive me, I commit my life. But you may have had your eyes on Jesus or not, in the scriptures or not, but now he's giving you ears to hear the voice of Christ through the text recorded. And he's given you mouth to speak. Speak his name. Speak his glory. Speak what he has done. Speak. And what's at the root of it all? What's at the bottom of it all? What explains it all? He, speaking to myself, he cares for me. He cares for me. I'm not just a problem to be fixed. I'm not just a statistic to be counted. He cared for me. And he continues to care for me. Giving me ears to hear and eyes to see and a mouth and lips to speak what is true. What is right. What is life in him. That's his work, amen? If you're not a Christian, and we thank God that you would even be here if you're not or you're not sure. He still does this today. He still does this today. He still, I don't know if he speaks that word, or batha, whatever that word is, but he's still opening ears. He's still granting speech to confess his name and to surrender and repent. He's still opening eyes. He's still the Savior, the sympathetic, compassionate Savior who cares for individuals. Uh, that gives me so much hope for my Thanksgiving dinner. Because I know for many of you, and perhaps us too, not everyone at the table has had their ears opened. And although they may have a speech impediment to praise the Lord, they don't have a speech impediment on other things. Some of them are given a lot of business about the church. Some of them are telling, telling me what the church needs to do or didn't do. And some of that's true. Some of it's not. Their story is deep. There's hurts. There's, there's all sorts of things. And the details matter. What's Jesus' response to them? Even when they may be angry at us or angry, Jesus sighs. It's not a sigh of criticism. It's not a sigh of judgment. It's a sigh of mercy. Hmm. Are we still sighing? Thou, Reverend, still sighing? Am I still praying? Am I still speaking plainly, but speaking gently? Am I still being more like Jesus? Less like the culture, less like my own heart. Well, if I'm not, 
May the confession of the Gentiles convict you and provoke you as it did me. What do those who witness this miracle do? First off, when I get to heaven, I am going to find Mark and say, you didn't give me one detail how the, the deaf and mute man responded. I mean, he must have gone catatonic. New creation, I can hear, I can see. I mean, he must have been like running around giving free gift cards to anyone that would listen to him. I mean, what a story. Not a single detail. What's up with that? But the detail he does provide is the unbelieving Gentiles. Verse 37, who confess about Jesus, he has done some things well. Is that what your Bible says? He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. I don't know how they knew that, but Jewish people know that. That's a messianic promise Mark has inserted in this episode. And the word used for mute in verse 37, is only found one other place in your Bible. Isaiah 35, where Isaiah prophesied of the Messiah, say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. They shall, then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the Mute, same word, same word in the original, according to the scholars. Mark, through the confession of these observers of this miracle, is declaring the identity of Jesus of Nazareth, who performed this miracle. William Lane writes, the choral exclamations of the crowd is the response of faith which recognizes in all the works of Jesus God's promised intervention. They are realizing what is happening. They are recognizing. And they are saying, he through Jesus has done all things well. There is my thanksgiving morning devotion as I gather before the Lord and I consider amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost I now am found I was blind but now I see you have done all things well and save me. You're not done. There's still things to be due. There's still many bad things going on in the world. There's still brokenness. There's still, there's still, but you, Jesus, are and have and will. The second thing, the second thing that Mark draws his attention, I can close with this, is these folks are ready to party. They get it. God has arrived. God is here. Only God can do this. And God is among us. And who are we? We're the unclean ones. We're the outsiders. We live in Decapolis. Only God could have done this. And he has chosen to do this in our midst. Even when Jesus tells them to be quiet, it's almost it's a provocation to them. They get more loud. It's like when you tell your kids, I don't know, when they were young, I don't know, we had this issue to chew with their mouth closed and not speak with their mouth with food in it. They would chew with their mouth open and speak with, you know, that was sort of their provocation. Jesus says, don't say anything, and they just get louder and louder and louder and louder because they have become convinced. This miracle points to the Messiah, God's humble king. This savior is a 
gentle, compassionate Savior who has compassion on the individual. And this gospel gives spiritual hearing and spiritual sight and spiritual speech because of his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins. True faith, this Thanksgiving comes when we listen to Jesus and confess with our heart what Jesus reveals about himself. What would it mean for Bauer Evans and you today to say that Jesus has done all things well today? Doesn't mean there aren't issues. Doesn't mean you don't have struggles. But they were saying this about God before the cross and resurrection. In what areas of your life do you find yourself doubting the goodness, wisdom, power of Christ today? Since trusting and following Jesus will always be a matter of the heart, quoting Romans 2. How does the kindness of God revealed to us in Christ lead me and you to turn to him afresh and trust in him and obey what he commands? We'll give the last word to the psalmist. It is good. It is good to give thanks to the Lord to declare your steadfast love in the morning your faithfulness in the night to sing praises to your name. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I can sing for joy. Thanks be to God for this day. May we remember it. Let's pray. What a day in the life of this nameless individual. Yet a day, no doubt, he never forgot. What a day in our lives, Lord, when we bowed our knees, so to speak, and confessed with our lips and believed in our hearts that Jesus the Christ is Lord. What a day since that day as your new creation, as each and every day we experience, albeit imperfectly, maybe in very finite ways, but nonetheless, Scripture is clear, real ways, new creation. Every day is resurrection day. Every day we commune with the resurrected Lord who lives and cares and ministers to us because he loves us as individuals. Thank you. Thank you for your grace in sending us Jesus. Thank you for your mercy in opening our ears to hear and our mouth to speak. Thank you for your church and for your word that your church is built upon that calls us to remember this. And thank you, Lord, for this story which now invites us to take this message and a display of its compassion and care to those at our Thanksgiving table because you love them and you're not done with them and you want to use us to express your love and mercy again. Be glorified through Mark 7 in our lives this Thanksgiving. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Let's stand.